This is one of my favorite chapters, by the way. It's called A Colorful Symphony, and that that is something we call um, an, an oxymoron. An oxymoron are two words put together that um, are opposites of each other. So a colorful symphony is an oxymoron because a symphony, symphony is actually a song produced by an orchestra. So an orchestra is all the people playing all the different instruments. But a symphony is sound. And this chapter is called a colorful symphony. So how can a symphony be colorful? Let's just get to reading. As they ran, tall trees closed in around them and arched gracefully toward the sky. The late afternoon sunlight leaped lightly from leaf to leaf, slid along branches and down trunks, and dropped finally to the ground in warm, luminous patches. A soft glow filled the air with the kind of light that made everything look sharp and clear and close enough to reach out and touch. Alec, oh, that's Alec Bings, right? He's still with them. Alec raced ahead, laughing and shouting, but soon encountered serious difficulties, for while he could always see the tree behind the next one, he could never see the next one itself and was continually crashing into it. After several minutes of wildly dashing about, they all stopped for a breath of air. And so Alex, because Alec Bings can see through things, but he can't see what's right in front of his nose, he keeps crashing into the trees that are in front of him. I think we're lost, panted the humbug, collapsing into a large berry bush. Nonsense, shouted Alec from the high branch on which he sat. Do you know where we are? asked Milo. Certainly he replied. We're right here on this very spot. Besides, being lost is never a matter of not knowing where you are. It's a matter of not knowing where you aren't. And I don't care at all about where I'm not. This was much too complicated for the bug to figure out, and Milo had just begun repeating it to himself when Alex said, If you don't believe me, ask the giant. And he pointed to a small house tucked neatly between two of the largest trees. Milo and Tok walked up to the door, whose brass nameplate read simply, The Giant, and knocked. Good afternoon, said the perfectly ordinary sized man who answered the door. Are you the giant? asked Tok doubtfully. To be sure, he replied proudly, I'm the smallest giant in the world. What can I do for you? What did we? What did he just say? I'm the smallest giant in the world. Are we lost? said Milo. That's a difficult question, said the giant. Why don't you go around back and ask the midget? And he closed the door. Now I need to take a moment here to tell you that even though the author is using the word midget, he wrote it at a time when midget was acceptable to say for little people it is no longer acceptable to say midget when referring to little people you should refer to them as little people okay moving on they walked to the rear of the house which looked exactly like the front and knocked at the door whose nameplate read the midget how are you inquired the man who looked exactly like the giant are you the midget asked Tok again, with a hint of uncertainty in his voice. Unquestionably, he answered, I'm the tallest midget in the world. May I help you? Do you think we're lost? repeated Milo. That's a very complicated problem, he said. Why don't you go around to the side and ask the fat man? And he, too, quickly disappeared. The side of the house looked very like the front and the back, and the door flew open the very instant they knocked. How nice of you to come by, exclaimed the man, who could have been the midget's twin brother. You must be the fat man, said Tok, learning not to count too much on appearance. The thinnest one in the world, he replied brightly. But if you have any questions, I suggest you try the thin man on the other side of the house. Just as they suspected, 
The other side of the house looked the same as the front, the back, and the side, and the door was again answered by a man who looked precisely like the other three. What a pleasant surprise, he cried happily. I haven't had a visitor in as long as I can remember. How long is that? asked Milo. I'm sure I don't know, he replied. Now, pardon me, I have to answer the door. But you just did, said Tock. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten. Are you the fattest thin man in the world? asked Tock. Do you know one that's fatter? he asked impatiently. I think you're all the same, said Milo emphatically. Shh, he cautioned putting his finger up to his lips and drawing Milo closer. Do you want to ruin everything? You see, to tall men, I'm a midget, and to short men, I'm a giant. To the skinny ones, I'm a fat man, and to the fat ones, I'm a thin man. That way, I can hold four jobs at once. As you can see, though, I'm neither tall, nor short, nor fat, nor thin. In fact, I'm quite ordinary, but there are so many ordinary men that no one asks their opinion about anything. Now, what is your question? Are we lost? asked Milo once again. Hmm, said the man, scratching his head. I haven't had such a difficult question in as long as I can remember. Would you mind repeating it? It slipped my mind. Milo asked the question again. My, my, the man mumbled. I know one thing for certain. It's much harder to tell whether you are lost than whether you were lost. For, on many occasions, where you're going is exactly where you are. On the other hand, you often find that where you've been is not at all where you should have gone. And, since it's much more difficult to find your way back from some place you've never left... I suggest you go there immediately, and then decide. If you have any more questions, please ask the giant. And he slammed his door and pulled down the shade. Now that paragraph would probably take a whole day to analyze, so we're not going to do that. But uh, if uh, some of you want to go back and reread that paragraph, that's a good one. I hope you're satisfied, said Alec when they'd returned from the house, and he bounced to his feet, bent down to awaken the snoring humbug, and started off, more slowly this time, in the direction of a large clearing. So, you know, like in a forest where there's like an open space, that's called a clearing. So the last part with the whole, the same guy in the house, that's just another exploration of something we already talked about, point of view and about how everything looks different from different people's points of view, right? If you're thin and somebody's heavier than you, they look heavy, but then there are people that are heavier than them and they look thin to them and so on and so forth. Everything is a matter of perspective. Do many people live here in the forest? Asked Milo as they trotted along together. Oh yes, they live in a wonderful city called Reality, he announced smashing into one of the smaller trees and sending a cascade of nuts and leaves to the ground. It's right this way. In a few more steps, the forest opened before them, and off to the left, a magnificent metropolis appeared. A metropolis. A metropolis is a city. So if you've ever heard of the metro, like in uh, Washington, D.C., they don't call it the subway, they call it the metro. Polis, that refers to city. So, okay, so they're in the middle of the forest, they come to a clearing, and then all of a sudden, a magnificent metropolis appears. A city, in the middle of the forest. The rooftops shone like mirrors, the walls glistened with thousands of precious stones, and the broad avenues were paved in silver. Is that it? shouted Milo, running toward the shining streets. Oh no, that's only illusions, said Alec. The real city is over there. What are illusions, Milo asked, for it was the loveliest city he'd ever seen. Illusions are things that are not real. Illusions, explained Alec, are like mirages. And 
Realizing this didn't help much, he continued, And mirages are things that aren't really there that you can see very clearly. How can you see something that isn't there? yawned the humbug, who wasn't fully awake yet. Sometimes it's much simpler than seeing things that are there, he said. For instance, if something is there, you can only see it with your eyes open. But if it isn't there, you can see it just as well with your eyes closed. That's why imaginary things are often easier to see than real ones. Then where is reality? barked Tok. Right here, cried Alec, waving his arms. You're standing in the middle of Main Street. They looked around very carefully. Tok sniffed suspiciously at the wind and the humbug gingerly stabbed his cane in the air, but there was nothing at all to see. Gingerly, the humbug stabs his cane gingerly in the air, which means carefully, like he's like, wait, there's a street here? What's going on? It's really a very pleasant city, said Alec as he strolled down the street, pointing out several of the sights which didn't seem to be there and tipping his cap to the passers-by. So, try to imagine, they're walking through this clearing, there's nothing there, and Alec is, is acting as if there is something there. He's like looking at buildings, and there's nothing. There were great crowds of people rushing along with their heads down, and they all appeared to know exactly where they were going as they darted down and around the non-existent streets and in and out of the missing buildings. You've got one city called Illusions that's off in the distance, and it's beautiful, but you can't get there because it's not really there. And then you've got another city called Reality, which you should know by now is things that are real. That's reality, but it's not there. But all the people in the city are there, and they're walking in and out and down the streets as if the city's there. So what's going on? I don't see any city, said Milo very softly. Neither do they, Alec remarked sadly. But it hardly matters, for they don't miss it at all. It must be very difficult to live in a city you can't see, Milo insisted, jumping aside as a line of cars and trucks went by. Not at all, once you get used to it, said Alec. But let me tell you how it happened. And as they strolled along the bustling and busy avenue, he began. Now pay attention. You're going to have to explain the difference between the city of reality and illusions. So you already know that illusions is a city that looks beautiful from a distance but isn't really there. And now let's find out what happened to this city of reality. Because there is a connection to your city and your life. Many years ago, on this very spot, there was a beautiful city of fine houses and inviting spaces, and no one who lived here was ever in a hurry. The streets were full of wonderful things to see, and the people would often stop to look at them. Didn't they have any place to go? asked Milo. To be sure! continued Alec, but, as you know, the most important reason for going from one place to another is to see what's in between, and they took great pleasure in doing that. Sometimes when you're traveling, we call that the scenic route. You know, you don't necessarily want to get there fast. Sometimes you want to take your time and take the long way so that you can see all the sights, and that's what the people in this city like to do. Then, one day... Someone discovered that if you walked as fast as possible and looked at nothing but your shoes, you would arrive at your destination much more quickly. Soon, everyone was doing it. They all rushed down the avenues and hurried along the boulevards, seeing nothing of the wonders and beauties of their city as they went. Milo remembered the many times he'd done the very same thing. And, as hard as he tried, 
there were even things on his own street that he couldn't remember. Now pause here, because this is a very common thing with people. For example, I take the same route to work every day. Sometimes, I notice things that have been there every single day for years that I never noticed before because I'm not paying attention. And in a city, this is especially true. Because everybody's just, I gotta get here, I gotta get to the train station, I gotta catch the subway, right? I gotta, I'm in my car, I gotta get where I'm going. And nobody actually pays attention to what's going on around them. Everybody's sort of stuck in their own little world. And so the lesson here is that when you're going from one place to another, pay attention to the world around you and what's going on. Because that's exactly what Milo didn't do. When he walked home from school at the beginning of the story, he walked down with his head dejectedly and paid attention to nothing that was going on. To the people in the city of reality, instead of taking their time and enjoying the sights around them when they went from one place to another, they started looking down and getting places faster and faster. No one paid any attention to how things looked, and as they moved faster and faster, Everything grew uglier and dirtier, and as everything grew uglier and dirtier, they moved faster and faster, and at last a very strange thing began to happen. Because nobody cared, the city slowly began to disappear. Day by day, the buildings grew fainter and fainter, and the streets faded away, until at last... It was entirely invisible. There was nothing to see at all. So, of course, this doesn't happen in the real world. Just because you don't look at something doesn't mean that it just disappears. But in a way, it kind of does. Because you're not noticing what's happening. And in the book, of course, this literally happened. Because the people weren't paying attention to the beauty of their city, it became ugly. And then it disappeared altogether. And they didn't even notice. What did they do? The humbug inquired, suddenly taking an interest in things. Nothing at all, continued Alec. They went right on living there, just as they'd always done, in the houses they could no longer see, and on the streets which had vanished, because nobody had noticed a thing. And that's the way they have lived to this very day. Hasn't anyone told them? asked Milo. It doesn't do any good, Alec replied, for they can never see what they're in too much of a hurry to look for. Why don't they live in illusions, suggested the humbug. It's much prettier. Many of them do, he answered, walking in the direction of the forest once again. But it's just as bad to live in a place where what you do see isn't there as it is to live in one where what you don't see is. Think about that one for a second. Maybe reread that line. It's just as bad to live in a place where what you do see isn't really there as it is to live in a place where what you don't see really is there. Perhaps someday you can have one city that's as easy to see as illusions and as hard to forget as reality, Milo remarked. That will happen only when you bring back rhyme and reason, said Alec, smiling, for he had seen right through Milo's plans. Get it? He saw right through Milo's plans. Now, let's hurry, or we'll miss the evening concert. They followed him quickly up a flight of steps which couldn't be seen, and through a door which didn't exist. In a moment, they had left reality which is sometimes a hard thing to tell, and stood in a completely different part of the forest. The sun was dropping slowly from sight, and stripes of purple and orange and crimson and gold piled themselves on top of the distant hills. The last shafts of light waited patiently for a flight of wrens to find their way home, and a group of anxious stars had already taken their places. Remember what I said about how the author describes settings as if they're, they have personalities. But it, it's kind of cool when an author 
describes a setting by giving things personality. Here we are, cried Alec, and with a sweep of his arm, he pointed toward an enormous symphony orchestra. Isn't it a grand sight? There were at least a thousand musicians ranged in a great arc before them. To the left and right were the violins and cellos, whose bows moved in great waves. And behind them, in numberless profusion, the piccolos, flutes, clarinets, oboes, bassoons, horns, trumpets, trombones, and tubas were all playing at once. At the very rear, so far away that they could hardly be seen, were the percussion instruments. That's like the things you bang, drums, bells. And lastly, in a long line up one side of a steep slope, were the solemn bass fiddles. And bass is, you hear it in songs, but you don't really notice it. Bass is that. Bass is very deep and low, but it, it puts the rhythm into your body. And we're going to look at the podium. On the podium is uh, the conductor. Conductor sounds like ER, but it's actually OR, and that's a spelling word, so make sure that you remember that conductor is OR. And the conductor is the person who conducts the orchestra through the movements of their hands and sometimes even their bodies. They're, they're like a guide for the instruments to play at the right times and to move in the right ways. And so the orchestra follows the notes in front of them, but they also follow the conductor. On a high podium in front stood the conductor, a tall, gaunt man with dark, deep-set eyes and a thin mouth placed carelessly between his long, pointed nose and his long, pointed chin. He used no baton, you know, baton, but conducted with large sweeping movements which seemed to start at his toes and work slowly up through his body and along his slender arms and end finally at the tips of his graceful fingers. I don't hear any music, said Milo. That's right, said Alec. You don't listen to this concert. You watch it. Now, Pay attention. As the conductor waved his arms, he molded the air like handfuls of soft clay, and the musicians carefully followed his every direction. What are they playing? asked Tok, looking up inquisitively at Alec. The sunset, of course. They play it every evening about this time. They do? said Milo quizzically. Naturally, answered Alec, and they also play morning, noon, and night, when, of course, it's morning, noon, or night. Why, there wouldn't be any color in the world unless they played it. Each instrument plays a different one, he explained, and, depending, of course, on what season it is and how the weather's to be, the conductor chooses his score and directs the day. But watch, the sun has almost set, and in a moment you can ask Chroma himself. It's an important paragraph. What the conductor and the symphony do is they don't make music, they make color. And they make the color of the day. And the conductor's name is Chroma. It's a, actually a Greek root. Chroma means color. So when you see the word chromatic, it means related to color. Chroma. Next page. The last colors slowly faded from the western sky, and, as they did, one by one the instruments stopped, until only the bass fiddles, in their somber, slow movement, doom, 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 were left to play the night, and a single set of silver bells brightened the constellations. Now, constellations are those shapes made of stars. So, when the music dies down, the sun has set, and the bass fiddles are playing just those low, deep notes, and there's these little tinkle bells, and when the bells tinkle, the stars start to come out.
That was a very beautiful sunset, said Milo. It should be, was the reply. We've been practicing since the world began. And reaching down, the speaker picked Milo off the ground and set him on the music stand. I am Chroma the Great, he continued, gesturing broadly with his hands. Conductor of color, maestro of pigment, and director of the entire spectrum. Now look at those three words. Maestro, that means master. Pigment is just another word for color, and spectrum refers to all the colors in order. Spectrum. Do you play all day long? asked Milo when he had introduced himself. Ah, yes, all day, every day, he sang out, and then pirouetted, which means spinned, gracefully around the platform. I rest only at night, and even then, they play on. What would happen if you stopped? asked Milo, who didn't quite believe that color happened that way. See for yourself, roared Chroma, and he raised both hands high over his head. Immediately, the instruments that were playing stopped, and at once all color vanished. The world looked like an enormous coloring book that had never been used. Everything appeared in simple black outlines, and it looked as if someone with a set of paints the size of a house and a brush as wide could stay happily occupied for years. Then, Chroma lowered his arms. The instruments began again and the color returned. You see what a dull place the world would be without color, he said, bowing until his chin almost touched the ground. But what pleasure to lead my violins in a serenade of spring green, or hear my trumpets blare out the blue sea, and then watch the oboes tinted all in warm yellow sunshine and rainbows are best of all, and blazing neon signs, and taxicabs with stripes, and the soft, muted tones of a foggy day. We play them all. As Chroma spoke, Milo sat with his eyes open wide, and Alec, Tok, and the humbug looked on in wonder. Now... I, mi I really must get some sleep, Chroma yawned. We've had lightning, fireworks, and parades for the last few nights, and I've had to be up to conduct them. But tonight is sure to be quiet. Then, putting his large hand on Milo's shoulder, he said, Be a good fellow and watch my orchestra till morning, will you? And be sure to wake me at 523 for the sunrise. Good night, good night, good night. With that, he leaped lightly from the podium and, in three long steps, vanished into the forest. That's a good idea, said Tok, making himself comfortable in the grass as the bug grumbled himself quickly to sleep and Alec stretched out in midair. And Milo, full of thoughts and questions, curled up on the pages of tomorrow's music, and eagerly awaited the dawn.